like cannon fire after the show. Like we could go R rated here. Cannon fire that. Just so, <laughs> can- so, so the Jim, you can- were. Okay. So, Paul, you were saying about um, how Goyer is really at fault here. No, I'm saying that he's primarily at fault because. Over Snyder. Oh, well, no, Snyder being the director and having the old, and the final creative de- vision. Right. Never mind that he's going to have the uh, WB producers hounding a neck. Well, we need to put in this because we're going to be promoting this movie. You know, basically doing everything anti Marvel. <laughs> yeah. Because nobody wants to be you know the back one in the back end trying to catch up with the front runner. But um, Goyer has this sensibility from. Blade, that you have to be dark and you have to be badass. And not every superhero translates that way. It's, it, you got to realize what the milieu of the particular superhero is. I mean, you've had, for example, uh, my previous pet peeve was a Blue Beetle. Um, one character, but then uh, Keith Giffen and J.N. Dementis. Excellent writers, but um, they were playing Justice League as a parody, and Blue Beetle was front and center. Mm-hmm. But instead of seeing that as just that portion and forgetting the uh, long story history of Blue Beetle with Steve Ditko, and then later the relaunch series after Crisis on Infinite Earths, right. um, yeah, Beetle really became just character. a joke character. And this was even after Dan Jurgens worked really hard in Justice League America and afterwards to rehabilitate that character so that he would take his place among the, the big pantheon of DC characters. And everybody just kept seeing him as a joke. Right. And thus, ineffectual, had to be sacrificed. Like the Aquaman debacle that happened really, until recently? Mm-hmm. Yeah. That too. He really is a, the, the definition of potential lost. Because right? they built him up and, and he was progressing so well and then, again, he... All he did was deliver the punchline. But but in regards to your earlier point that we didn't, damn, we didn't cover in that last segment. We didn't cover in that last segment how Zack Snyder really wanted to direct the Batman movie, but he was forced to direct a Superman movie. <laughs> well, when you're offered a ton of money to take on a project, you really don't say no. So you really can't blame him. But the, the, the thing about Zack Snyder is that he's got a brilliant visual vision. I mean, 300 is a seminal work, and it is spectacular to look at, mm-hmm. okay? And he does have an eye. Same thing with Watchmen. Watchmen, despite the fact that it's a little too faithful to the book because it has the pacing issues that the book has, it's great for a comic, it's great for a piece of literature, mm-hmm. it doesn't really translate for a fluid movie-going experience, but damn, that's a beautiful movie to watch. Yeah. It is. Okay? It is. And if you look at Immortals, Even with all the blue penis. <laughs> <laughs> I just have to bring up the blue penis. <laughs> that was uh, yeah. I'm surprised it wasn't in the child park. I want to bring up the top of the blue penis. Look at the blue penis. Not the small penis, the blue penis. Dude, blue penis. I. Okay, the thing is, the reason why I bring it up is that parents take kids to superhero movies. So what happened when I Watchmen went? Watchmen is an R-rated <laughs> film. That should have told somebody. Something. Yeah, really. I'm there at Lejeune Cinema Six watching Watchmen for like I'm the sorry. for the <laughs> no, it's fine. It was like a matinee. I just wanted to watch it again because I saw it the first two times, and I was like, ah, let me let me try it out. Let me you know just watch it on a Tuesday afternoon. What do I see to my right? A like a seven year old with their with their dad sleeping, mm-hmm. and you just see this big blue dingus right there and it's like holy crap man <laughs> I mean I, w- I was just saying about that but yeah it, really it, it, it was really dingus, <laughs> don't we all I mean to be fair I think the only gripes really with Snyder is is that BVS had so much potential and he failed at such a spectacular level okay. Let's say if BBS really is a continuation of Man of Steel, you could have addressed the issues that Man of Steel had. And you saw where they were going. But one of the main issues with this film is that all these plot lines were undeveloped, unresolved, or thrown under the rug. Okay? Where do we see Superman's remorse at taking Zod's life? Mm hmm. It was brushed aside of course the conclusion because guess what? We have to finish the movie. So, okay, he cries for a minute and then, oh look, I'm happy Carl Lockheed Clark Kent. I'm gonna go with the girl I'm trying to, you know, get in with. 
and then we get to, to Batman versus Superman. And we're led to one plot contrivance after another, which supposedly the Ultimate Edition is supposed to address, but really, we're supposed to see the Ultimate Edition. Mm -hmm. I feel that if they were just focused on Batman versus Superman and on all these other characters, like I, I appreciated Wonder Woman, but if they wouldn't have focused that little time on her and that weird dream sequence of the Flash and all this other things of data that they I'm, found, I'm too early. Lois is the key. And the, <laughs> and the Lex Luthor thing. I think it would have been generally good. Like even though it would have just been the Dark Knight Returns, like I think it would have been generally. You good. had a okay. blueprint to a perfect Batman versus right. Superman movie with Bruce Tim with that that world's finest three parter. Mm -hmm. You could go back to him. I'm being right. Okay. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> no, Paul has a point here. Mm -hmm. no, but, yeah. uh, okay. We're not even talking about those, we're talking end story elements, okay? Some apologists have tried to say that this was a learning curve for Batman, that this was a story where Batman is at one point and he comes to an epiphany to another. By the end, it's like, I failed it. You tried to kill him only 20 minutes ago, maybe 30 minutes ago. Right. Where is the epiphany? Just because your both your moms have the same name. Martha. Okay, but let's not even let's let's look at Batman again because Snyder just wants to direct Batman, even though he may not get the chance now. But if you're going to have this being an actual character arc where Batman goes through some sort of challenge and change, because essentially that's what all fiction is. You start out at one point, you go through a series of experiences that change you fundamentally one way or the other, and then you arrive at this end point, having earned this new insight. Okay? We get Psycho Batman, who murders off of Killing Spree. Yes, we get hints that maybe the Joker did something to Robin. The only way we know that is because it says the joke's on you, Batman, and it's inferred. But we never get a sense of who Batman was before that happened. We don't get that sense that Batman was maybe a little lighter, maybe less tough on crime, maybe more of an idealist. We don't have that. We don't have that compare and contrast of where Batman was to where he is now. So by the time you get to the end of the film where he says, I failed you, how do we know this? You've been a psychotic mad on killer for the entire there film. There you go. Okay. To add on to your point, like, okay, yeah, a Robin died. I didn't feel like he was really, like, they didn't address him grieving at all. Which is, you know, when freaking Jason Todd died, even though people voted for him to die. I voted against. Yes, I'm that old. They feel, <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, you felt Bruce, like, grieving. Like, you felt the sadness of the character. Like, I mean, he's always, he's generally, generally sad. But the implication is that this has happened a few years ago. Right. So you're not going to get that because... He's over it. Well, he's not, he's not over it. But he's internalized. He's damaged. And, it's, and he's, he's damaged, damaged by, by He's already processed it. He has a hey. tattoo of damage on his but forehead. See, here right. is all, <laughs> but here it's all implication. And here, again, Snyder's a great storyteller. Right. And what's one of the best rules of fiction? Show, don't tell. Okay? Mm -hmm. You see Wayne Manor in ruins. Bruce doesn't go there anymore. You see the, the, the costume. Okay? In memorial. So you're getting, you're picking up pieces of why Bruce is broken. But fine. Why not show when Bruce wasn't? Mm -hmm. Where's the Batman that we can say, well, maybe he wasn't always such a bad guy? Can I counterpoint that with maybe that's why in Suicide Squad, that's what we're seeing. However, Suicide Squad mentions Superman. So this is obviously after Man of Steel, but yet before BVS. Actually, it's after BVS. But yet Superman is they dead, so dead. why would they mention it? Because Superman changed. If, if we're going by just what's said in the trailer, all that Amanda Waller says there is Superman has changed things. Mm -hmm. That's it. Yeah. I can still reference that when he's gone. He still made a change. Ah, uh, then I inferred incorrectly. Okay, so it, it, it's, again, because it's unclear. Right. Okay, but then we can't be using another film that's not narratively part of this structure to justify that. Mm -hmm. Everything's yeah. got to be within the story that's told. Man of Steel provides foundation for the for the actions going forward, but you can't use Man of Steel as a complete crutch. Batman versus Superman on its own has to tell a complete story. Exactly. In and, and of it itself. No. And it does It was too convoluted and it was just all over the place and you couldn't follow it. You didn't get any value out of what was what you were watching. Okay, here's the other model. 
Here's the other moment. Okay, if you're going to if you're going to film something in that world, you should try to keep with the conventions of that world. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes. Some people have argued that it's ludicrous for Clark Kent to have glasses and that be an effective disguise. Whereas Christopher Reeve proved, no, it's not. Right. Okay? All you have to do is change your voice, change your body language, mm -hmm. make it seem like there's no absolutely way in hell that nebbish could be the Man of Steel. Okay? But yet, Snyder goes out of his way to show secret identities. I'm like, oh! Because I discovered you're Clark Kent, and I know Bruce Wayne is Batman. Mm -hmm. Because And true, in real life, yeah, he probably would. But this isn't real life. Comic books aren't. Comic books can be allegorical to real life, or sometimes can make direct reference to it. I thought Captain America punching in the face. And no, we'll get me started on Hypercap. That's all. <laughs> but but um, if you're going to play in that world, then there's certain conventions you have to accept as plausible within that world, even if they don't reflect in real life. Right. Superman has a secret identity, and people don't know that Clark Kent is Superman. If they figure it out, it's through other means or such, but you don't... You can't be too real with it. Right. As much as as much as it's logical, but part of the magic of watching superheroes is that wish fulfillment and it is that buying into these things. These are the things that Okay. Superman's conceit has always been if the person could see the real me. Okay? Not Spider Man. Spider Man always hid the real him. Okay? The real him came out when he put on the mask. Okay, but Clark initially had to hide his abilities. Before John Byrne took over, Clark was milk toast, even from Action Comics number one. He got mm -hmm. pushed in the face from a bully in front of Lois Lane. Right. Okay? So but the whole thing about Superman is if she only do the real me. Okay? So it, 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 there's a cathartic moment that comes when you're ripping open the, the shirt and showing off the S. Okay? But anyway, meets my pants. And <laughs> <laughs> And Zack Snyder takes it away, it removes that catharsis. There's no, this is only you, sort of thing. So it, so it demystifies Superman, and it takes something away. It takes something essential away from the character. It takes something essential away from the presentation. Why even bother putting on the glasses at all? Right. Why even tr bother trying to put on a normal one? Hot damn, dude! I could listen to you talk all day. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Like yeah, seriously, man. Uh, well, how much mem how much memory you got on this thing? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I I want to keep it. Damn, we went. Wow, that was a full segment. Yeah. <laughs> this is the fifth segment. Okay, <laughs> one of the weird things about Superman that's always kind of okay. Back to your point with the, the whole like like secret identity thing. How how the heck did they not ever realize it's Superman? That guy is huge. Like Superman is massive. Yeah, like both John Byrne. Like even in the clothes, like it must like he must look like a freaking tree inside, like his little <laughs> both like John, nerd clothes. Both John Byrne in Man of Steel, mm -hmm. and the Man of Steel, the comic book, and Mark Wade in Birthright went out of their way to show that if you just dress him differently, put on clothes that are a little too baggy, right. change the hair, make him slump, smooth, slump mm -hmm. you could possibly get away with it. Yeah. Maybe not Body 100% language. of the time, but you can get it. Also, in Birthright, he changes his glasses. Mm -hmm. the, the, they change the tint of his eyes. He reaches out to tint. shake your hand, or his hand is like... Or, yeah. Okay, <laughs> how many of you here have seen Office Space? Yeah. Okay, Steven Root. He's got these Coke bottle glasses that mm -hmm. make him look like he's like a Muppet. Right. right. Okay? And it's a jarring effect, and you laugh. But then you see Steven Root in a production like uh, most recently, All the Way, um, the uh, Brian Cranston, Lindsay B. Johnson movie for HBO. And it's a night and day difference. Well, that's, I mean, that is one of the attributes that a real actor has. Uh, using the whole body language and uh, to create a character uh, to complete that illusion of being someone else. And at least Clark, who can move faster than a speeding bullet, would be able to read all the books featuring acting, wouldn't he? Mm -hmm. Now, um, I'd like to cover something that you touched on, supporting cast. Lois Lane, Martha, okay? Martha! Yes, they're sounding boards, okay? They're what the character uses so that to fill the rest of us in on what's going on in his mind. Right? I think that uh, this Lois and, uh, did uh, a better job of it than in the, than the first one in, in Man of Steel. Right? And I actually enjoyed the little bathtub scene 
<laughs> in more ways than one, eh, Jim? In more ways, ways than one, one Jim. The only time in Batman versus Superman you could say Superman's actually having fun. Yeah. <laughs> and he seemed genuinely human. He goes, all right, there's a hot babe and there's water with me. <laughs> okay. Hey, but uh, the Martha Kim, when you mentioned it before that you were, uh, you didn't, you know, like her take on it, I actually felt that that was perfect for the character. Hey, because she, as a concerned mother, would want to defend her child and say what's best for her child. Hey, while valid, he, that right, is valid. Yes, while he right, would then be, uh, be emphasized that he's willing to make the sacrifice. All right, on behalf of the rest of us. Well, on that note, I think we're we're done, right? No, we're, 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 we're done. On, well, I mean, yeah, we can, but I'm hungry. <laughs> Julio's hungry. Paul, are you hungry? Probably. Are you hungry, Jim? <laughs> All right. And uh, until next week. Signing out. Again. <laughs> Later.